almost kind of was able to address the problem that I saw. And that was that these animals, mice and rats and other pests are treated as disposable and not like. Hey, how's it going? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on this. Yeah, I. Well, last time I actually interviewed you on the normal album when the when that one came out, but it was over the phone. So this is yeah, the first I, time it, uh, via the video. <laughs> yeah. Well, nice to uh, put a face to the name of the voice. For sure. For sure. I'm super excited to do this. Thank you so much. I am too, man. It's a real honor and real pleasure. Cool. Uh, so this is about you and your journey in music. I know we, we we chatted about that last time, but maybe we can, uh, you know, discuss, do a little quick backlog of what we, we talked about before. And then obviously what you've had and what you've done since that record came out, I guess. Sure. That's absolutely. Um, are we uh, are we recording now? Is what we're saying now canon or are we cutting? Yeah, in? yeah. No, we're going. I mean, okay, we can cool. cut. <laughs> but I always just go with it. You know what I mean? I just wasn't um, sure if I had... Hold on, let me just really quick. No, I'm just. Sorry. <laughs> um, I love it. Awesome. Well, you are you're from New York, correct? No, I'm originally oh. from New Jersey, but I live. Oh, in New Jersey. Jersey. Got it. Okay, talk to me about New Jersey. Uh, what part were you born and raised in? Oh, I grew up in a uh, nothing little suburban town, like two square miles of you know myopia, but that's about it. Not too much to comment on. Okay. Uh, you know what? I don't understand my own instinct to criticize my own hometown without even saying anything of any actual substance about it. What I call them close minded. What on earth? Where am I from? Um, <laughs> geez. Um, I think you can see a lot of that uh, cynicism and just immediate instinct to, uh, you know, uh, just criticize the world around me in my last record. Um, I don't know what my deal is on that. <laughs> it's so, all good, man. Uh, sorry, uh, beloved hometown, whose name I won't mention for the sake of... Uh, Backlash? Uh, well, uh, I don't think that my hometown's going to cancel me or anything, but rather I've dealt with some really creepy characters as of late, and I just don't like to put too much personal information out there. I got you, man. I, I totally understand that. Well, so when did you get into music? Well, I started taking piano lessons when I was like five or six years old, but I didn't start, you know pursuing my own interests as a musician until I was, I think around the same age, most songwriters start writing songs around like 13, something like that. Okay. Um, when I started, you know, switching from formal piano lessons to more informal piano lessons with someone whose role was more a songwriting mentor slash unwitting therapist. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I think just, it, it tends to be that, Teenage angst mm -hmm. is a big launch pad for a lot of people's songwriting careers. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, essentially my career started with, uh, not my career, but my pursuit started with, I'm going to try and vent some, you know, some feelings I'm having. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to tell myself that whatever I write, no matter how uh, terrible an adolescent it is, is the best thing ever. And eventually, you know, uh, you convince yourself you're great for long enough and eventually you get kind of good at it. Um, I like that. But notice how once again, it comes through that constant urge to criticize. I even con it just criticized just, a child right there. It's just like self-deprecating, man. I know. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, man. I do the same exact thing. I, I, I see <laughs> in your story, a lot of myself, actually. Um, but I, I, I was, I was curious. So like 13, you start writing, but weren't you, are you involved in, you were involved in theater, right? Through school. Is that some, a big part of it? Yeah, I mean, I did like all the school plays when I was a little kid, and uh, I did all, you know, and through my teenage years, sure. Um, I think that is kind of just, um, I think that probably was a really important part of my eventual development into an artist was the fact that I was used to being on stage and used to being in front of a lot of people at once and, you know, uh, whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you start writing around 13, uh, was that something that you felt comfortable sharing with other people or was it something that you kind of held yourself? Um, you know, I don't quite recall. I think some of it I wanted to share, probably. Other parts of it I very much didn't. Um, okay. But I was very supported. Um, my uh, family was always super supportive of my creative pursuits. And so there was plenty of stuff that I did share and that uh, my parents uh, had to 
had to face. Um, you know, they had to face the conundrum of, well, we want to support our kid, but we also don't want him to get the idea that he should go off and try and be a professional musician someday because God forbid, <laughs> it's a terrible idea. <laughs> it is, it's a terrible idea. Um, you know, uh, it took a, a long time for them to eventually like, you know, they were always supportive and they were always right. like, you know, there for me and always at all of my shows when I was a kid. Um, but, you know, if you're a good parent, you're going to, you know. Right, uh, right. Kind of yeah. second guess the the artistic route in life. Well, at least, you know, for the sake of the well-being of your child. And so, like, you know, I do recall sharing some stuff with my family. I don't, I guess I probably did share some stuff with friends. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember very well. All right. Well, like with that, like you said, you your parents finally came around, obviously. You've been, you're doing this and you're, you're successful at it. Like, was there, a, a, not to go too far ahead, but like, I'm curious to know if there was a moment that you kind of got that validation from them that they're like, oh, okay, he's doing this and it's working out for him. Um, there wasn't really a single moment. It just kind of happened over time, you know, and they were right. always validating. They were never discouraging. Um, sure. they just never wanted to, uh, you know, see me set down a path that was unlikely to yield positive and healthy results for me. Sure. Um, and so, you know, they were always uh, validating for sure, though. Okay. Just, uh, just eventually it became, oh, okay, he's making a living and I don't have to worry anymore. Right, right, right. Okay. I understand now. Uh, with with that, like, uh, did you, did, were your parents musical at all? Or like, are you kind of the only one in the household doing that stuff? Um, I mean, uh, my, my mom has some musical background and musicianship does run somewhat in my family. Uh, but I'm the only person in the family who... Uh, in the immediate family who has, you know, uh, followed it as a career path. Okay. And was there anything that drew you to piano? Was that something that you were interested in or? No, it's just when, uh, when my grandmother passed, she, uh, um, we inherited her old upright piano. Oh, wow. And, um, I guess, yeah. Um, I think my parents always wanted, always wanted a musical family. They always wanted their kids to have that. Um, and I just happened to be the only one of my uh, siblings who ended up continuing yeah. to play uh, piano past a certain age. Okay. Did you do that in the, like, were you, were you in like the jazz band or anything like that through middle school, high school or I, I, orchestra? I, or? I played some, so I, I tried, I tried clarinet and trumpet in middle and high school. And uh, I gave them both up, and I do very much uh, regret that because those are such wonderful instruments, and they're on half of my songs nowadays. And right, so, right. Darn, I could have saved some money too. <laughs> uh, did you end up going to college for music? No, I ended up bouncing around various universities, never actually landing on a solid major for longer than a few semesters. I ended up okay. studying uh, a a, a, a made-up major theater and comedy at a university in my area that um, really was kind of cobbled together between two disparate uh, uh, departments, neither of which were uh, big enough or well-funded enough to be a major on their own, and so they decided to be uh, innovative instead, and uh -huh. um, you know, just went with uh, just went with that and. Uh, I dropped out before I could complete my theater and comedy degree. And thank God for that, because that would have been such a waste. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, for, when you were you pursuing, I mean, you must have been pursuing music full time at that point when you were attending school or theater, at least. And I mean, theater comedy, was it all kind of just sh in the show entertainment world that you wanted to land? Yeah, I I just knew that I was pretty good at entertaining people and I knew that I had a pretty creative uh leaning um field of interests you know i i just i i knew what i was kind of good at and i knew what i liked to do and so i wanted to figure out a way to make my living doing that and eventually eventually kind of just was that music was the one that was working um mm -hmm. uh, i didn't see a path to becoming a professional illustrator or artist or whatever i don't know why i said the word illustrator um uh <laughs> And I, I, I guess I didn't um, see myself all that cut out for stand up. Although I do now do stand up when I tour. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I had a wide variety of creative interests, and it's just it just so happened that there was 
I don't want to say a market for my music. I mean, ultimately, I guess there was, but mm -hmm. um, it was, it was, I, I, I didn't start pursuing my music full time uh, until after I had put out my first record. Um, I was still going to school with every intention of graduating and still work at a day job for a while. It wasn't until like, I don't know, the late 2016, maybe in 20, uh, 2017 that I started, um, you know, really pursuing it full time and certainly wasn't making a, an, an actual living off of it until like the height of the pandemic. Sure. Sure. Um, well with that, like, cause you, cause you have, uh, uh, Will Wood and the Tapeworms, was that the first, was that record the first part of this or did you put a record out by yourself, like as just Will Wood? Like, where does the career begin? Like, tell me about that first recording and, and what that entailed. Well, the the first record that I put out was uh, Everything is a Lot, which was released under the name Will Wood and the Tapeworms, which okay. I chose because I wanted to, um, I wanted it to be, you know, I wanted to put out a solo record and I, I had played in garage bands before um, and I'd played in other bands in the local circuit before, but I, I had never like, you know, led my own. And this was right. my first time leading my own band. And I wanted to put out a solo record while also drawing attention to the fact that there are other guys here that deserve some credit while also being able to, you know, tell uh, booking people on the local independent scene that they can get a band. Um, <laughs> sure. because nobody just wants a guy and a keyboard on the punk scene. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I, I started playing with a band in 2015 and that band went through a ton of lineup changes. It's actually kind of funny. I never had a, I didn't have a consistent lineup between releases until after I stopped calling the project Will Wood and the Tapeworms and started just calling it Will Wood. Oh, I interesting. the same band for every Will Wood release, but every Will Wood and the Tapeworms releases had different Tapeworms on it. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, um, yeah, it started with the Will Wood and the Tapeworms record, which really was intended to be more like a demo than anything else. Mm -hmm. Something that I could like, <clears throat> um, you know, hawk for five bucks at an indie show or just throw around as, I don't know, at, uh, at whatever, at open mics. Mm -hmm. um, and so I recorded it with the intention of it being kind of like a almost like a greatest hits album by somebody who's never released anything before. Um, okay. just trying to pick out my favorite songs I'd written since I was a kid. Um, and, uh, you know, at least my late teenage years and, um, was meant to kind of just be a, yeah, a, a show of the range that I was, uh, you know, I guess capable of. Sure. Um, so, but it just ended up being something that worked for me. I, I, I didn't expect it to turn into what it turned into. Um, I played a show with a band. I played my first Will Wood and the Tapeworms show and people seemed to really like it. And I just kept doing it until eventually it was like, okay, so do I do this or do I keep going to class? And it was like, well, going to class isn't making me any money. So you know. <laughs> let's keep doing this. <laughs> and were you just staying local? Like, at this point, were you living in New York or were you still in Jersey? Jersey, yeah. Okay, so you're in Jersey still. And then when you put out the second record, uh, with Will, Will Wood and Tapeworms, were you also still in Jersey or like what, did the career progress at that point? Uh, that was that was still in New Jersey because my second record only came out like a year or so after my first one. Right. I started recording it like a six months after I put out the first one. I was given an opportunity to work with this producer who had some really great credits behind him, uh, uh, Kevin Ontrasian from Dillinger Escape Plan, um, who rushes an incredible to band. <laughs> and he he's incredibly talented um and he offered to do my record uh you know with a with a bro deal uh but i had to squeeze it in before he left on tour and so i was like okay i'm gonna cobble together bits of music um see if i can turn these few songs that i have into an album make sure that i get all the higher energy ones out because right now i'm on the punk scene and they want you know mm -hmm. they want high energy they want heavy stuff um and uh you know, I then had six months to put together this next record. So I, uh, so I, some people apparently are under the impression that after my second record, I went on hiatus um, because I put out my second record in 2016 and didn't mm -hmm. put out another one until 2020. And in reality, it's like, no, that was, that was there was a lot of work in there. Uh, there wasn't supposed to be a second record, you know? Um, oh, that was okay. like, 
you know, it was like, oh, I have this opportunity and I have to take it. Otherwise, you know, it wouldn't have happened. Um, right. That was very much a product of circumstances that I was like, oh, yeah, no, no, okay, sure, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, because um, he he was willing to work with you basically, like you said, as a bro deal, and it's like, well, I got to take advantage of this. Right, and we had a limited window to do it, and and right. so, you know. Um, and so it sounds like what it sounds like because of those circumstances and it came out when it did because of those circumstances. Um, but, you know, uh, totally wasn't what, you know, uh, what would have happened without those circumstances at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then from, well, moving forward, I mean, obviously there's a great deal of stuff you had going on in those four years that there wasn't a, a release, so to speak, you weren't on a hiatus, but like, tell me what you had going, like, what was like, what were you working on? Like, what was the, what were those four years in between? Um, it was playing shows, okay. playing, just trying to play as many shows as possible, trying to tour. I put out a live album. I shot a concert film. Mm -hmm. I, um, uh, I, I, I tried a lot of different things. Um, did a lot of touring. Did, I, I was doing a lot of different work. Um, and it just wasn't, you know, no opportunity to record had presented itself. The first time I put out a record, it was because my good longtime friend, John, was working at the studio that Kevin Ontrazian works at, and he was able to offer me a deal. And the second record was because Kevin was able to offer me a deal. And so since nobody was offering me a deal, I was like, okay, better go pound the pavement and <laughs> sure. get my name out there until another deal comes my way. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, last time we spoke, what I thought was so interesting is you talked about you put these these big like almost like theatrical shows together, correct? Yeah. And like instead of having the tickets say like so you were having to pay all these people, so the ticket price was up a bit, but that would also attract attention of people, which I thought was a brilliant idea because it's like oh there's a five dollar show happening at this club tonight, like the band's probably trash, you know? What I mean like there's no it's what there's like that weird fine line there, and you're like yeah I was charging twenty five bucks. But it wasn't because I was being greedy, but it was because I was paying out the people and people were getting a show. Hmm. Well, I, I, hmm? I was just going to say, like, that was that was that in those days? Was that kind of what you, what you were pushing with? It was during that period that I was just I was still I was trying to find my footing. I was trying to figure out how I could, you know, uh, make enough off playing shows and selling merch to, you know, have a, a living mm -hmm. and. I was trying all kinds of things to do it um, and trying to make enough money doing what I do so that I could put out another record and I could tour and I could do these things that were very challenging to do back then. Um, and, uh, you know, so yeah, that period of time was spent basically doing that hustle. Um, and then I, you know, got into Patreon mm -hmm. in, I want to say late 2017. Wow. And so a lot of my work ended up focusing on that because that ended up being the first reliable and consistent source of income I had through my work. Um, That's so crazy I, to get into that, get into it early. I mean, it's a brilliant thing, obviously. And I, I know that your the record we just talked about last time was a crowdfunded album, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, with, with Patreon, was that just something you had stumbled upon or you were like, like, how did you build a community within Patreon? Was it just from being out and seen in the, in, you know, in the, in the local area or touring or? Yeah, it was mostly that. It was, you know, doing the DIY grind and getting my name out there and making sure that everybody who I got in front of learned that I had a Patreon. Okay. <laughs> I want to, I don't know how, how open you're to talk about it, but like, um, I'm, because I'm, I've also, uh, I'm an AA and I, and I have addiction issues. Like I, I did read that that was kind of a, one of your things early on in your career. Hmm. Yeah. I, uh, and how did that uh, affect it? Like, like, how did that affect you, the, the, the career or like where, whereabouts did that kind of, where did you realize that? I think that, um, I got lucky. A lot of musicians don't develop a problem with substances until the height of their career. Right. Um, uh, but I actually, no, it wasn't, it, it was, uh, um, uh, uh, quitting drinking was an, an enormously important part of launching my career. Um, if I hadn't stopped drinking, I wouldn't have the career that I have. Um, I wouldn't have had the career that I had at that time. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly wouldn't be where I am now, but I wouldn't have, have even gotten to where I was then, you know? Um, like, uh, I, I mean, I, I, w I was a wreck and 
it was the first time I played with the tapeworms uh, in 2015. Uh, that was the first time that I played a show on the local scene without getting sloshed first. And I never played a show drunk again. Um, and so part of me thinks that maybe my career was actually a part of my recovery there. It was uh, instrumental mm -hmm. uh, for lack of a phrase that doesn't potentially include a pun. Um, right. <laughs> right. You know, uh, um, That's really interesting. So you hadn't played, uh, you weren't, obviously you were, weren't doing sober shows until this one. And was that, that must have been terrifying going into that originally, right? Like, okay, how do I, you know, I don't know. That's how I would have felt. Like, how do I maintain, like, I'm, like, you know, really, like, I haven't done this before, essentially. You know, I actually, I don't think I did feel any anxiety about that. I think I was more an anxious about the idea of being, um, of being drunk on stage at that point because it was my first time taking on an artistic project that meant that much to me. And so I knew full well that when I got on stage drunk, I was a mess and I was not good, you know? Right. Um, and I didn't want this opportunity that I had and all these people, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't want this opportunity I had to go to waste, nor did I want to let down all the people who were then relying on me to make sure that we all had a, a good night together. Um, there were a lot of, you know, there were there were people who's, you know, yeah, they were they were counting on me to not be a mess. Right. And, uh, and my entire, um, you know, all my dreams were wrapped up in it, too. And it was right. like, okay, for the first time, I have more to lose uh, by drinking, you know, mm -hmm. um, so well, that's incredible. I mean, to, to, to see that, to be self-aware in that sense, to be like, okay, like I could really screw this up. Like, this is what I really want. And to be able to, you know, have the willpower to, to not. Right. I mean, that's a tough thing in itself when it comes to that stuff. Well, you know, they, they, they say that, you know, a lot, a lot of times you don't change until you have to. And I guess in that moment right. I had to, um, you know, uh, there were a lot of different factors. It wasn't like it was just that, that, you know, sure on my feet, but, uh, that was definitely part of it. That's, oh, that's incredible to hear, man. I mean, yeah, like, it's like I said, I've, I have the same issue and thinking when you're speaking, it's like, oh, I remember the, you know, moments the same way with, with my career in radio, like being like, oh, I thought I was so awesome and so great. But then you think back and I was like, I was trash. And then right. I look at like when, when that all changed and it's like, like, how was I even doing that? Like, I don't even understand that. Like, it's just, it's so just to, to be, to have that, like, you know, standard, like, you know, the 2020 view of the thing or whatever hindsight of, of it all is just so interesting, but that's incredible. That you're able to see that, especially that early on. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So we, we talked about last time you had a crowdfunded record and you even said like, it wasn't until 2020 that you were able to really just do this basically hundred percent on your own, like full time. Right. Uh, I was about, yeah, it was early 2020, maybe late 2019 that I was like, okay, I can actually afford rent now. Okay. Um, you know, I was relying on other people in my life up until that point. And then, mm -hmm. you know, things turned around. Was that crowd, was that crowdfunded record? Was that something that was done through Patreon? Like, how did you like, tell me about the process of doing that and like being able to put this record out? Uh, my last record, the normal album, it was, uh, -huh. uh it was funded through uh, Indiegogo. Okay. And, uh, basically, I just offered various um, campaign exclusive perks or benefits, as they call them, uh, mm -hmm. you know, exclusive merch and experiences and stuff like that to people who contributed to the campaign. And I just did the same thing for my upcoming record. Oh, really? Okay. For case I make it, that was the, it, the, yeah. the same, same process then? Yeah, um, pretty much. I mean, I used a lot of what I learned from the last time around to conduct uh, a more successful this, uh, campaign this time around. Um, and also I just had a bigger audience at this point. So it was, uh, it was a, a huge thrill and a, definitely a, a successful operation. Mm -hmm. Super grateful for that. I mean, having the Patreon that you, you had built over the course of the years must, you're already ahead of the game, right? When now the, when the pandemic started, cause that's, everyone was like, uh Oh, now what do I do? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, no, I definitely, yeah. Yeah, I, I, everybody, uh, 
I got super lucky. I had a source of income that was already online. I already worked from home and uh, everybody, it sucks because it's like everybody around me was getting slammed economically while all of a sudden I was doing 10 times better than ever, ever because right. we were looking for something to do inside and I was the only person, you know? Um, so I was like, you know, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's weird. Uh, but I think it's, it's almost like, it's like the pandemic launched my career and I hate it. Um, you know, it's like, uh, and it was also just the, oh, I have so many opinions about what the pandemic did to culture and how it forced everybody inside and in front of the algorithms all the time and how that yeah. put people's heads. And I, 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 I think that that had a big part in what ended up happening in my career. Um, and I could go on and on all day about that and I, I won't bore you with it, but, um, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, I, to, to be honest, I feel like it, as horrible as it sounds, is I feel like my podcast was in the same boat because I was did terrestrial radio for 17 years. And then, uh, the pandemic hits and we're like recording shows from our house. Like there's nothing live. There's no one driving around. So like the, the fun and the, the thrill of doing that just became like this mundane, like audio wallpaper ish type. I'm doing these things, but no one's driving around listening to it. No one's like tuning in really from their home. Everyone was like focused in on the news and blah, blah, blah. But then all these artists are sitting at home like, Hey man, like you've got this podcast. Like we got nothing going on. We'd love to chat about our new song. We have this thing going on. And then it just became like so many, you know, it, it just did this with the two, with the two things I was doing. I yeah. mean, it sucks, but if, if it wasn't for that, then I wouldn't have had the, you know, the amount of people coming to me as, as there were, as it stood. At the time. So you had a similar experience where like, mm -hmm. it was at like the start of the pandemic that you started to see traffic coming to your work a lot more. Yeah. That's yeah. like, I mean, it was, and it was solely because now, I mean, I'd started the, the, the podcast in the beginning of 2019. So it's like, I was doing it and it was a thing, but then it was like, so I, it was, it was kind of like how you were saying, like you were a name out there, like people knew who you were, you were out there doing the, the grind work. And then it was like, oh, well, you've already begun to build something in this space. And mm -hmm. now people are trying to now catch up to what you're doing, essentially not catch up, but like, oh, well, you've, you're like, well, I've already been doing this. You mentioned that you you mentioned that you were doing radio work for 17 years. I'm looking at your face. I'm like, where is, where are those seven <laughs> years? I appreciate that. How uh, old are you, man? I'm 37. Yeah, oh, geez. You look younger than me. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, you managed to squeeze 17 years of career in that face. Look at you. Uh, yeah, uh, I know. Um, Can you believe it? I'm no, just kidding. But... Love all the luck. But um, uh, <laughs> where, where did you, what did, what did you do in radio? I was on the air. Like, like, uh, like doing what specifically? Like, did uh, you get the show or? Yeah, well, yeah, I was just a guy. I did, uh, you know, five hours or four, depending on, yeah, five hours, depending on what market I was in and played the records and talked about songs. And it was pretty much that. Did it for uh, corporate radio stations and did it at the end of my career for an independent station. Uh, that was a really massive one in San Diego and which was cool because I had more freedom to do stuff that was fun. Uh, but in the same, same sense, it was like the, the, unfortunately companies like the radio stations were just bleeding because they weren't getting advertised money. Right. No one was going there. Yeah. So it was yeah. like, I'm watching this thing. Like it was, yeah, it was hard to see and like hard to see a lot of friends lose jobs. And it was like, this is crazy. Like the biggest DJs, the biggest programmers on the planet at the time or in the country at the time were losing their gigs. I'm like, how is this happening? Like, this yeah. is nuts. You're going to let this guy go because you think what that this isn't going to end ever like I, it just to me it wasn't making sense but then i'm also at the same time people are coming to me like yo like hey blah 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 is, wants to talk blah, blah blah you know and it was like sure yeah i'd love to chat with x y or z right so it was it was just bizarre um but i, I mean i'm forever grateful for it obviously but it sucks the circumstance of it yeah yeah, it's a weird time. It's a very weird time. Not just like, you know, in, in, the, in the creative sphere, in the business sphere, um, you know, it, it, it totally affected everything. And then on top of it, it's just already before the pandemic hit, I can imagine like a lot of people working in radio might, might have had started to work up a lot of anxiety because a lot of people knew like everybody was going to podcasts, everybody was going to, you know, streaming and whatnot. And it was mm -hmm. probably a lot harder to, you know, 
get by doing radio work. Um, you said that you worked at like multiple different stations. Was that like something that like people uh, doing what you over do? the course? Yeah, yeah, over the course of time, I did. And there's yeah, so there there's in the if you work for a bigger company, then you are on multiple stations at once. Yeah. Uh, as far as like you might be the afternoon person at this station or the you know day you know, midday person here and the night person here and the weekend person here. It just like, that's how it, it works. It, it, yeah. But, uh, that's the, the really last, the last station I was at, I was only on the one station, but I was, yeah. I mean, I wore multiple hats there, but it was, and it was fun and it was great. And I, and I, and I love that company and the people that I worked with there to death. And it was like, I don't have anything bad to say about it whatsoever, but it was just one thing that wasn't working for me when I saw the 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 balance of what was happening so for me it was like oh i should just i love talking to music musicians and i love being a part of the music industry and i don't want to lose that uh because of a pandemic and possibly being like okay everybody lost their job now what do i do right. try to find something else that i have no skill set in i mean i don't know <laughs> it's just bizarre but I mean, to be able to like for, for you on the Patreon thing, like, were you doing like online shows or releasing like content? Like, how are you continuing to, to grow and grow and grow even pre pandemic? Well, my Patreon was only partially dedicated to my music at the time. Okay. Uh, it was also dedicated to other creative pursuits that I had uh, a zine with uh, oh, cool. that like followed like, um, like almost like a serialized novel of sorts. Um, you know, various little things here and there, a blog, it was, you know, a behind the scenes thing to a certain extent, and then also just some additional stuff. And over the course of the pandemic, yeah, what I did is because I couldn't go out and tour, which was my whole thing is that I loved touring. Mm -hmm. um, I started doing live streams from my house in the pandemic. And that's what really started to make a little bit of money for me. Um, and I just got lucky, you know, um, that the record I put out in 2020 happened to get a lot of attention from people. Um, it's I think, an incredible album, man. And it's in it. Yeah. And you look at the numbers on it. It's like, it's insane. I mean, it, it, you deserve it, but it's, just, yeah, it's so cool to see that. I think um, to a certain extent, the algorithms were able to determine that these songs contained uh, themes that people might want to argue over and therefore pushed it to more people's for you pages. Ah, okay. My theory, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I give social media platforms a lot of credit when it comes to the strength of their AI systems. Um, it's pretty insane. I, I, if you I really think, think about it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but I, yeah, I just got lucky that the stuff I said, um, which, you know, that the stuff I, I put in, in this album um, just happened to resonate with people at that, you know, at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, were you so, writing like with this next record? Cause it, it was, it, were you writing from that place of what was happening during the pandemic? Uh, somewhat. Yes. Um, the record that I have coming out, uh, in case I make it mm -hmm. is a collection of songs from the past few years. I think that the oldest song on it, I wrote in 2018. Um, but a lot of it has, it certainly has the. I think the sort of pandemic feel in there because some of the songs were written during that time and a lot of the songs were then uh, uh, rewritten or adjusted or reapproached during that time. And certainly I've changed a lot over the past few years as a person, as mm -hmm. well as an artist. And so, um, you know, a lot of that is in there, um, as is the uh, experience of going from, you know, uh, barely getting by to being overwhelmed with attention. Um, that's in there as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely partially that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very, it's a very different piece of, uh, it's a very different piece of media than my previous records for sure. I've heard two songs from the record. I think, well, Tomcat uh, Disposable, that's, is that, that's going to be on the new record? Yeah. Okay. Well, first tell me about that song, and then I, I want to I know about uh, Cicada Days. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, Tomcat Disposable is, is a song that I wrote from the perspective of a mouse that I had to kill in 
uh, the winter of uh, 2020, or maybe it was even early 2021 by then. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I have an affinity for rodents and pests of all kinds. Uh, if I squash a bug, I feel awful about it. I just, mm. I think that I feel a sense of almost like, I don't know, it sounds dramatic, um, or maybe kind of silly, but I see an animal that is ultimately harmless or at least innocent in its nature that doesn't want to cause anybody any harm and isn't going to do what you isn't going to hurt you and um, but people still are grossed out by and misunderstand and just hate you know you see this little creature this little mouse which I find adorable and it all it wants is a warm place to live and some food to eat and you know we jump up on our chairs and scream eek a mouse kill it and then we kill it um and of course when it comes down to it it's for practical reasons some of them carry diseases they shed all over your kitchen and you can't have that right right but you know i feel like this you know weird affinity for them where it's like i know that you're just trying to live and yet you're you're looked down on and seen as less and sometimes i feel like that i guess and um uh or at least i have felt like that at many points in my life and uh or maybe i'm reading too much into just finding mice cute but whatever the reason <laughs> um uh one night i walked into my kitchen to find a mouse attempting to drag a big parmesan rind through a crack between the wall and the oven and I immediately fell in love with this animal. I keep pet rats. Um, so I had pet rats growing up as a oh, kid. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how my mom decided that would be a great pet for me, but, but I had them for years upon years. Oh, wow. Yeah. They're, uh, they're phenomenal pet, uh, pets. I've, I've been keeping them for a few years myself. And, um, and so I see a mouse and it's like, if you, if anybody else saw a, a stray dog, you know? Um, and so the mouse ran into that, crack in the wall and I tried breaking up the Parmesan into smaller pieces so he could, you know, fit it through the hole. Um, I guess my roommate had left a big chunk of cheese out on the counter and, um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I wanted to be this thing's friend. And, you know, the people I was living with were like, I get it. It's cute, but it's filthy. And the, the knife drawer is filled with shit. And I'm just like, yeah, but I mean, I handle rat feces all the time, taking care of them. You know, sometimes they poop on you even. It's like, it's not a big deal. And they're like, these are wild animals shitting in our kitchen. You can't, just, you know. <laughs> this is not your pet in like the yeah. wood chips inside you. <laughs> exactly. And I eventually was like, yeah, but it can't, how, how dangerous could it actually be? And then I looked it up and I was like, oh, this thing, it's particular, specifically a deer mouse that we had. And that one is specifically like the biggest vector for hantavirus and Lyme disease, <laughs> uh, you know, the former of which will kill you 50% of the time if you contract it. Sure. So I was like, okay, so I got to get rid of this thing. And it was the, you know, the dead of winter. So even the have a heart traps would have been inhumane because he would have put it outside, dislocated it, uh, and it would have just died Close out. To death, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is just going to be slower and more difficult. Um, you know, if and if it survives, it'll be by getting back in the house and making you do it all over again. <laughs> um, and uh, dropping off in a different neighborhood. <laughs> that was, I, yeah, I guess I, I could have I could have considered that, but <laughs> just um, the um, but ultimately, all I had were these uh, you know Tomcat brand disposable traps, um, and uh, and my landlord gave them to me, and they were like, get rid of it, take care of it now, and I was like, okay, fine, and. I uh, set out some of these traps. They're like little blocks of poisoned food. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I saw that there was, there were bites out of the food and I never saw the mouse again. And, um, and it broke my heart. Um, I was just like sobbing for days. Um, I just, I couldn't stand it. And I wrote this song, Tomcat Disposables, uh, because I just felt so rotten about having killed this mouse that I, really what I wanted to do was help. I, I, I wanted to give it a good life, which is a ridiculous thing ultimately, like, man, grow up. But at the same time, like it's, it's like, it broke my heart mm -hmm. and I, 
I feel awful about it still when I think about it. And uh, I, I'm so grateful for how the song's been received because one, it's such a huge change in the sounds that I tend to gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. uh, it's stylistically very different from what I've put out before. It shows a much more, uh, I don't know, soft and sensitive side to what I do, I think. And mm -hmm. it's uh, a lot more vulnerable than a lot of my previous work, I think. Um, it's also one of the most complicated arrangements I've ever put together. And I'm very proud of the fact that I, you know, really like composed every last note of it and used instruments I'd never used before. And so I'm super thrilled that people are gravitating towards it and seem to be so moved by it, especially forgetting all of that, forgetting all the pride that I have wrapped up in it as an artist. I also feel really fantastic about the fact that this creature whose story I found so tragic by virtue of the fact that it was so undervalued and seen as nothing more than a past mm -hmm. is now being mourned by thousands of people all over the world that there are thousands of people all over the world who have heard this song and seen the video that ivan owen and i made and you know and felt something for this innocent creature who i wish knew i wish that i could contact this mouse and somehow you know uh, communicate with an animal from beyond the grave to tell him hey listen everybody loves you and everybody uh and everybody misses you, you know, it's like there's, sure. there's something uh, beautiful about that. And mm -hmm. it almost is like, to a certain extent, I feel like, uh, with the help of Ivan Owen, uh, the engineer and animator who I teamed up with to make the music video for it, almost kind of was able to address the problem that I saw. And that was that these animals, mice and rats and other pests, are treated as disposable and not like us and not conscious beings and not, you know, really entitled to their lives. It it's like that was the issue that inspired the feelings behind the song. And now I I don't know, I'm I'm really proud of the fact that so many people now feel otherwise, at least about this one mouse. Mm -hmm. Um and it's like I was actually able to honor this, you know. In this this incredibly humble and dishonored creature and i'm just you know i'm thrilled about that that feels really good yeah i mean it's it is a, it's such an uh a great perspective i mean it's something i would have never even i mean i understand where you're coming from i was like okay i gotta get rid of this mouse but then to honor the mouse basically write this song and then have people really yeah like hear it and be like what you know attached to that at some some bit but you're right it's like uh you're 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 giving back to the mouse yeah yeah it's um a lot of people have contacted me telling me that it made them cry and whatnot and i'm like wow people are grieving this mouse that they've never heard of people <laughs> sure. people or that they never saw never encountered people rarely grieve mice at all um and so i don't know i i i feel like it may be the most concrete proof that I've accomplished anything as an artist that I've seen mm -hmm. is that I, I almost accomplished a task and that was get people to feel something for and then grieve an animal that I feel is not felt enough for and grieved mm -hmm. or enough. Is this a similar story with the cicadas? No, cicada things, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, it's, um, it just, it's, it's by, it's, uh, Cicada Day is is more of um, uh, more more self reflective in a personal sense. I think to a certain extent, Tomcat Disposables can be read fairly as a metaphor for something else. Sure, um, that's I, a, that's what I was thinking when I heard the song. I didn't think it was truly about what it was, but I, I mean, mean, it it was literally written about uh, a mouse. Um, but I also wrote it knowing that uh it could be read as more of an you know a metaphor but an allegory of sorts mm -hmm. um maybe metaphor i don't know the difference what am i doing talking like i know what literature phrases <laughs> um, i don't either i'm just agreeing with you like yeah sure it sounds good i know what a metaphor is so we'll go with that <laughs> um uh but um uh you know it's somewhat of a symbol for how i feel about my music career and how mm -hmm. a lot of people feel about a lot of different things in life that 
they are pursuing something that they think is going to be cheese, but is actually a trap. You know, um, the idea of a mouse trap is just a very simple, very straightforward metaphor for a lot of different things. And um, so there's something that's personal in there as well that isn't quite as dedicated to the animal. Mm -hmm. um, but Cicada Days is much more uh, self-centered. Sounds like I'm going back to just randomly criticizing myself and the world around me for no reason. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I um, it's it's much more self-involved, self-absorbed. Jeez, it's all it's all self-deprecating the way I'm describing it. It's personal. It's uh, um, how about introverted? There we go. Okay. That's a way of saying what I'm trying to say without yeah, yeah. Seeing myself. Um, it's uh, it's about, I guess it's about the end of a relationship, but it can be about something more than that too. Something less specific than that as well. I think um, it can be about change. Um, the thing that I, I, I think of is like cicadas spend the vast majority of a 17 year life cycle underground. Which um, is crazy. I, not, not to interrupt you, but so I'm originally from San Diego. The last time I interviewed you, I was living in San Diego. I've since moved to middle Tennessee. I live just south of Nashville now. Uh, I've been here for a little over a year with my, my family, my wife and kids. We moved here. The, the year we moved here was when the cicadas came up. Oh, yeah. Never heard of cicadas in my, like literally in my life, just because yeah. we didn't have that on the West Coast. Right. So I'm here and like, there's this buzzing sounds and people are like, oh, the cicadas are coming up for this first time. I'm like, what are they talking about? And then I see them and then I'm seeing guys like there's like on TV, people are like making them into some sort of food, like you can eat them. And I'm like, what is going wow. on here? Yeah. Like, I don't know. So this was, I'm like, is this a whole world that I've just never, ever, ever been exposed to? Or I didn't even know what they were. And then like, uh, and I noticed then your song's called that. I was like, oh, wow. I actually know what a cicada is right. now because if this was last year, I'd be Googling it or, right. like, you know, whatever. But like, yeah, it, and it's bizarre to know that it was, yeah, there are set. It's like 17 years, right? They bury themselves underground. Apparently they yeah, mate or something. Apparently there are different species or subspecies of cicada that uh, some of them spend even longer underground but apparently always a prime number of years so as to not coincide with other animals life cycles in a way that makes them uh, more likely to be uh, a victim of predators yeah don't quote me on that no. i don't i've just heard it and uh yeah i just that's just what i've heard um like that, that makes too much sense it's weird yeah yeah nature can be like that though sometimes can it you know mm -hmm. i don't know possible but um, uh, I could also be totally misconstruing what I've heard about cicadas. So you know, <laughs> I've heard the 17 um, year thing. That's why I was that one that up when you said that. Yeah. The 17 year thing is definitely true. They, uh, they spend, uh, you know, roughly 17 years underground, uh, feeding off of the roots of trees and then 17 years. I don't know when they decide it's time. Um, and I don't know what triggers them to and why it takes 17 years, like what chemical reaction in its brain takes 17 years to finalize. But right, and um, it's crazy to think that those little bugs are alive for 17 years, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like you think of like an ant, don't they have like a lifespan of like a 24 hour period or something crazy like that? It's like ants don't live long. No. And um, then you think this thing is outliving like dogs and, and you know yeah. certain other animals that you're like, how is this bug living for 17 years and then coming up at that point? Yeah, it's it's you, you're you're seeing you're in your senior year of high school. Uh but right. data is like, all right, time to go climb this tree. Right, and, exactly. It's so uh, bizarre. And so they they then climb the tree, they get to some point in the tree where they decide it's high enough. Um and they molt from their shells. Uh, and they turn into this enormous, terrifying fly that screams for like three months and dies. Mm -hmm. And there's something, I don't know, I, I, I mostly just liked the way the phrase sounded. And I feel like it carried with it some abstract feeling that I can't quite define. But I also feel like there could be something to be said about, you know, the idea that cicada days are, uh, you know, days of, uh, you know, last minute desperation. Um, 
cicada days are when you work for something forever and ever and hope for it and it doesn't quite pan out how you hoped it would um it's time spent screaming looking for the thing that you you know came out of your shell for um it's you know the process of coming out of your shell and finally saying hello to the world it's change um and so the song i guess the lyrics are kind of on the abstract side at least for part of it but towards the end over the course of the song it becomes more and more blunt and less poetic and flowery in its language and i think that that is really the um symbolically the cicada days of that song are all in the last chorus of the song when the song comes out of its shell and does its screaming after mm -hmm. waiting and being cryptic and unknown and in that last chorus where i don't repeat the phrase cicada days that time around and instead instead use the phrase the end of days um it's when i am blunt and straightforward with my lyrics in a way mm -hmm. um that i am not usually with my lyrics and so i'm i'm quite I'm quite curious to see how this song ends up affecting people. I, I took some risks with its production that I um uh that I'm I'm curious to see how it impacts people. I'm very curious. I dig it. It's definitely a more it's definitely a more mellow song compared to for what most you, of it, for sure. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. I guess up until the end when it comes out of a yeah. show. Well, I guess that's yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. You know, the first 17 years of the song. Um, you know, but um uh it's it's also yeah even uh, otherwise it's it's once again a significant stylistic departure from a lot of my previous work which i think is something i'm gonna have to talk about a lot over the course of the next <laughs> couple months um sure do a lot of like yeah it's a significant departure from my previous work but i have to say i think a lot of people uh are going to be focused on that and forget the fact that i've like switched genres like every other song that i've put out um and I think it's just that people most associate me with the with a particular portion of my work and see that as being uh, the stuff that I do. That is that that that's like that's who I am, mm -hmm. um, and that things that aren't spooky evil jazz are departures. When to me, the uh, the wacky cartoonish cabaret stuff was always a departure for me as much as anything else it's always been you know genre has historically been more of a tool for me than uh you know just a style that i gravitate towards that i, I like to use the hallmarks of various genres as methods of communication um and i i have to say i do that less with this record but not in the sense that the new record doesn't uh switch around genre wise at all it it isn't to say that the genre isn't hard to pin down on the new record or that i don't mess around with it it's just rather i didn't ever go how do i emulate this existing sound on this record i was it was much more just how do i create the sound that is um most conducive to communicating what i have to communicate regardless of using a genre as a symbol of something I, I don't think i'm making any sense my point no, is i know you are making sense it, it wasn't it, a conscious choice like the last record i put out there were times where i was like i'm going to use doo-wop in order to highlight x thing about what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. whereas this time around if it just so happened to sound like a 60s country song then it's like okay well that's just what it sounded like i don't know right um, right you aren't trying to to write in a particular genre or or chase something that you had done prior it's just i'm gonna write what i'm gonna write and it's gonna yeah i'm gonna do what i feel some of the songs i think people who are more who are familiar with my previous work um i i think some of the songs are going to surprise people in their sound and other ones i think uh, people are going to be like oh i yeah i do know this artist still okay i was told that this was going to be totally different but i get this <laughs> okay so um you know it's still me it's more me than my previous stuff and i think a lot of the new stuff i think a lot of people are going to start talking about how much more accessible it is and then a lot of people are going to take that as a bad thing 
and I want to be like, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to be accessible. Sorry, you know, <laughs> um, you know, that isn't to say that it's not still weird and uh, experimental uh, at times, and that I don't occasionally do things with the express intent of being obtuse uh, right. or abstruse, whatever. Um, oh, geez, I don't know what words I'm saying. Um, uh, it, it, the <laughs> point is that I'm just writing what's honest and what I think most accurately and authentically reflects who I am as a person and who I'm trying to be as an artist um, and what I have to say to the world. Because I think that as an artist, our primary responsibility uh, is... I don't know. I don't. I don't want to talk responsibility and art because I. I. I have my qualms with how people talk about media these days. Is always being you know discussions about responsibility and whether or not you're doing it right and all that stuff. Um, but at the same time, I think if we do talk about art in that sense, then I think something that people need to be uh, considering is the possibility that maybe one's responsibility is to be their authentic self as an artist because. Um, that's how you communicate with people in a real sense. That's how you genuinely connect with and genuinely offer the world something. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, try to be pretty and, uh, and uh, attractive, and you can try to present yourself in this perfect light and try and, you know, be a responsible media creator all you want. But ultimately, unless you're willing to share the stuff that's a little bit less pretty and a little bit more uh, raw and uncomfortable, you're not going to connect with people on a very deep level. I think intimacy requires us to, um, I think intimacy and therefore love, um, really requires people to understand and appreciate each other, not just despite before one another's flaws and quirks and all that. And so, um, my only goal with this record was to do it um was to do it exactly as i wanted to mm -hmm. <laughs> um and uh and by doing so hopefully reach the people who need to hear what i have to say um and who i need to say it to does mm -hmm. that make sense no completely completely i'm struggling yeah. i feel like this whole interview or whatever i've i've i've, I've struggled to find my footing as to how to speak about things but um, <laughs> you've done great man i appreciate it uh and thank you one red bull it's the problem oh you needed a couple more there you couple, go least, uh yeah. well i i appreciate it the record's coming out in july is that what i read july 29th yeah amazing amazing i do have one more quick question will i i again appreciate you being here again i'm glad i get to see you in person or in person uh via the computer uh and set over a phone line this time um but i want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists um people always ask me that and i always struggle to answer it because um because i want to be honest about uh about my experiences because i think my perspective is or not my perspective but rather uh, how do I put this? I want to be honest about it because I think that an honest uh, uh, assessment of what it's like to be a professional artist is severely lacking from how we talk about it um, and what we tend to tell aspiring artists. But at the same time, I don't want to be a downer and I don't want to be a pessimist or be discouraging or uh, you know anything like that. I want to encourage artists to create art because I think it's one of the greatest things you can do with your life. Obviously, I think that it's what I decided to do. But right. um, you know, I think it's I think it's an incredible pursuit, and I'm so grateful for what I've been able to do. Um, and there's nothing else I'd rather do. Um, but at the same time, I if you know we're talking about aspiring artists, we're talking about young people, and young people, you know. I don't know, uh, adults aren't honest with them enough or honest enough with them enough. Um, and it's like, I wanna say, follow your dreams, damn the torpedoes, uh, <laughs> believe in yourself, you can do this. But I also wanna say, hey, it sucks sometimes and it's just a job. And um, uh, that 
there's there are a lot of thrills and there's a lot of fun and it's great to be able to do something you care about and you love for a living it's phenomenal um but it requires a certain level of publicity and a certain level of notoriety in order to do what i do anyway um and i cannot in good conscience recommend that anybody pursue a career that uh requires publicity um because i don't think it's healthy especially not in the social media era i don't think it's necessarily safe i don't think that it's it's just not something that i could wisely and in good conscience tell a teenager to do yeah go try and be famous like good lord what what a terrible thing to you know what, what a terrible idea um it's like it, it's it's it, it is it's it's don't get me wrong, there are wonderful parts to it. Um, but the the amount of attention I get, which isn't even very much in the grand scheme of things, I'm not some celebrity. So I can't imagine what it's like when somebody actually gets genuinely famous. I can't imagine the nightmare people like that must live because it sucks to be watched all the time. It sucks to be seen as something other than just a person. It sucks to have the standards by which you are treated be different than it is for anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so it's terrible for anyone's mental health, I think. And maybe some people handle it just fine. I've met very few people who uh, are just like totally cool with it all the times, all the time. And the ones who do, I often think are working pretty hard to maintain, maintain that perspective. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm just not cut out for it. Uh, I certainly think I'm not cut out for it. Um, and if somebody like me who believed that uh, being a famous musician was what he wanted for so many years. I believe that's what I truly wanted for it to turn out that I was not cut out for it. Well, then it could be you too. And so, because the thing about dreams is that the second they're not a dream, then they're not a dream. A dream is totally within your control. When it, once it comes true, it's no longer your dream. It's reality and reality can suck. Sometimes reality is unpredictable. It's uncontrollable. And it is, uh, it is, um, it can be harsh. And so while I cannot stress enough how lucky I am and how grateful I am to be able to do something I love for a living, I also can't stress enough that if you're going to pursue it, you better be, um, you better be careful and be wary of the pratfalls that await you be conscious of the fact that you can't design it exactly how you want it to be and you can't control how you're perceived and that there are going to be things that happen as a result of your success if you are lucky enough to succeed that will be difficult and i can't understate how difficult that is sometimes so um my I want to like try and succinctly sum up my advice to people who are in that position, who are aspiring musicians and artists. And I've, I, I haven't been able to come up with a way to phrase it just yet, because now I've given you this whole like five minute long spiel and I don't feel like I've made my point properly yet, but um, I guess ultimately it's like, um, you know, uh, good luck is I guess what I would say. <laughs> Is, and I mean that in every way. I mean it as seriously, good luck. And I also mean that as whew, good luck with that, you know? So um, yeah, uh, your options are either to believe in yourself and risk failure or don't believe in yourself and guarantee that you fail. Um, and so that's if you're definitely sure you want it. Um, but be careful out there. That's all I can say. Bring me the bad